Okay, let's get started. Good morning. Um, my name is John Taylorson. Thank you very much for joining us this morning on this webinar about trade credit. Um, I'll introduce everybody very briefly, but they'll talk about themselves in a moment more. We have Hugh Thomas from Puffin Produce, who's chairing and facilitating this today. He'll be doing uh, the proper professional introduction in a moment. We have Sean Perrington from Avenue Insurance. We have Phil Mills from Old Mill Accountants and Financial Services. And we have Alan Thomas, the Regional Manager for Development Bank Wales. Hugh, why are we all here? Yeah, um, thank you, John. Um, just an introduction to start with. I'm Hugh Thomas, the uh, Managing Director of Puffin Produce. as my kind of day job. Um, my other my other role is that I'm on the, the Food and Drink Wales Industry Board. You know, we've been working with the industry in Wales and you know, acting as a bridge to the Welsh Government for the last four or five years. Um, and one of the work streams that we've developed um, that we feel is, is, is of help to the industry in Wales it is a kind of financial work stream that we feel uh, the Welsh Government can have a role in improving the skills within the sector. Um, and, you know, out of that work, um, the Welsh Government commissioned um, a block of activity that is being delivered by BIC, so hence, hence John Taylorson and Linda Grant delivering this work on behalf of the Welsh Government. Um, and, and that is the Investor Ready Programme, um, which helps businesses um, improve their financial skills. So this seminar is, is part of that kind of block of work and that block of assistance. So. Um, Hope that gives you a bit of context on how we're all, how we've arrived here today. You know, and uh, I'm no expert in trade finance, so I'll kind of defer to the rest of the panel on that. But uh, you know, welcome to everybody, and uh, I hope it's a uh, good meeting. Brilliant, thank you, Hugh. Great. So, trade credit insurance. Since the middle of March and the massive changes in our trading environment, food and drink producers, processors and marketeers have had to deal with a very different world. For many, it has been great news where the likes of delivered grocers, online retailers and food takeaway businesses have gained new business. For many others, it's been quite a different story. No hospitality means that hospitality, be they pubs, hotels, restaurants, sector, stopped overnight. Brewers who focused on the on-trade either stopped or had to switch and try and retail with various levels of success. But the same applied for countless other categories with meat, fish, cheese and dairy and delivered food van sales all struggling. Some of the companies in this supply chain have managed to recover some revenue by switching their business to more retail consumer orientated stuff, whilst others decided to furlough and get ready to come back. In either case, coming back to food service and hospitality is going to be very different. Trade credit insurance is a key element for many companies operating in this area, either because the companies have decided themselves that the supply customers need to be insured, or because they use invoice finance and that too relies on insurance cover being available. Why would trade credit insurance be a problem? Well, um, the first rule I always apply to insurance is, Generally, if you can afford it, you probably don't need it. If you need it, you probably can't afford it. And with companies like Altradius and others, just withdrawing cover overnight for the hospitality sector, this has put a lot of companies in a difficult position. But too many companies perhaps think like me and think insurance is only of value if you can claim on it. Yet the reality is that insurance claims should be a last resort. If anything ever did go wrong to the extent you needed to make a claim, it's because it's a showstopper. Also, is it worth the thought that if insurance premiums are so high for an activity, is it still a good idea for the reward that's going to come from that activity, or is the risk premium worth the risk? So today we're going to try and talk about, first of all, what trade credit insurance is, and who's it for, and why is it important, and also then what the alternatives might be. And it's not just about what we might be supplying and whether or not it's got trade, trade cover but what we can also do as food and drink companies to ensure that there's good cover on us. So without further ado, Sean, can I kick off with you with perhaps a better explanation of what trade credit insurance is? 
Well, that's not a bad start, John, at all. That's, that's very good. Uh, so my name's Sean Parrington. I'm the Managing Director of Avenue. We're a credit insurance broker. That's all we do. We place credit insurance policies. Uh, the market, as John quite rightly points out, is, is very distressed uh, right now. Um, and it's certainly worth exploring what credit insurance is and, and what's driving credit insurer behavior right now. So uh, some of the, the, the uh, people on the call may already have a credit insurance policy. They're relatively popular. They're not compulsory like some insurances. They're very discretionary. And essentially what a credit insurance policy does <clears throat> is it protects you from uh, a loss uh, where you've extended goods supplied services on a basis of trade credit. So um, <clears throat> that could be insolvency or it could be just a, a protracted default situation where your customer can pay you in theory but just won't pay you. So uh, the idea behind this is that the insurance policy is there as a as, as uh, a facility that can cover a truly unexpected loss. So the surprise loss, the names that we hear about that go bust <clears throat> on a regular basis, certainly in retail, if you look at you know companies like um, you know, Kath Kids and Laura Ashley, these have been businesses that have been struggling for some time and are no great surprise when they do fail. The, the benefit of a credit insurance policy is, is the loss that happens that no one saw coming. So in some ways, what you can what you can see the insurance companies as, and there are around about 15 insurers that, that operate in this space. They're bookmakers, they're taking bets. They're saying, uh, in turn for your wager, which is the premium uh, that you pay under the policy, um, I bet that that company isn't essentially going to go bust uh, or fail. Um, and the insurer is, is calculating the odds accordingly. I think what's happening now is that because of the, the outlook for all sectors, not just the food and drink and hospitality sector, insurance uh, cover is much more difficult to get. It's not impossible. Uh, you just have to work harder uh, to get where you, you need to be. So one of the things, Sean, um, where we use trade credit insurance in the past has been to smooth cash flows and sort of make business possible that otherwise would have been either high risk or difficult to finance. How much do, would you ordinarily expect to pay and what do you think the, the, the cost of this is going to be in the future? Yeah, we get asked that question a lot, John, you know, how much does credit insurance cost? And it, it does vary on a number of different factors. The, the first is uh, your turnover, uh, because that is clearly the amount of turnover you're, you're supplying or, or generating on credit terms is going to drive the pricing because that's where the risk is. Uh, so if you were to ask me to give you a, a, an average price, and of course there's no such thing as an average price in reality, but the average price would be something like, I don't know, 0.2% of turnover. So if you're, if you're turning over 10 million pounds, 0.2% of that is about um, 20,000 pounds. Is that right? Does, does that give you cover on all your customers? It would, you would normally get uh, a policy that would ask you to apply for a credit limit on the customers that you require cover on. And I think that's the nub of the issue, isn't it? It's what, as a credit insurance policy holder, if I apply for a credit limit on a particular buyer in your sector, will I get cover? Brilliant. Uh, so just to expand that point, our sister company is uh, Mitchells and Butlers. Uh, so we were recently asked by Mitchells and Butlers to front up to the credit insurance markets and just make sure that the insurers were still offering cover on supplies into M&B. And of course, they were, but <laughs> not as much as they were giving three months right. ago. So, so they didn't withdraw it, they just reduced it back? Yes. Yes. Okay, I, I should say to everybody, it was rather remiss of me, I didn't, you, everybody who's on this call can participate by using the Q&R, q and question and answer function on, on Zoom, and we'll, we'll try and capture those points as we go along. Just coming back to you, Sean, for a second, that, that business about working capital and reducing the, the, the headspace that you have on trade credit insurance, what do you normally find your companies do if it's um, reduced or withdrawn altogether? So because the market is the risk market, the risk environment has changed so dramatically, insurers are, are underwriting differently. And what they're looking for now, so previously they would have looked uh, uh, and factored in in, in, a, in a substantial way, public domain financials. 
And the problem at the moment is that they're just too old. They just don't represent the current trading position. So if, if you filed 31, 12, 18s as your last filing, you know, they're almost 18 months out of date and they're only going to age. So what we're doing at the moment with our customers, and we have a number of customers in the food and drink sector, um, everything from, you know, fruit and veg wholesale through to um, gourmet food companies to uh, poultry farms. Uh, we're actually helping them get up to date financials on their customer. So is that using management accounts to support yeah. their trade credit position? Absolutely. So the insurers are looking at up-to-date financials. They're looking at liquidity uh, in, in the business. They're looking at you know forward plans, confirmed orders, and just making sure that the exposure that they're running is a reflection of what the customer needs. Because as you can imagine, there are a number of companies that are holding big credit lines on organizations and entities that they don't really need. So it, it's about dialogue. It's about dialogue. And what do companies themselves what sort of things should they be putting in place if for example they don't have trade credit insurance at the moment but they maybe should think about how do we cover this risk and from your point of view what would they need to get in order before they came to you to get trade cover yeah so if you haven't got trade credit insurance the next best thing really is a, is an information report isn't it from a status agency uh, and you, uh, credit safe Experian done in Bradstreet, you know, others are available. Um, it's, it's the next best thing. Uh, some of our customers will also um, have in the past moved from essentially bad debt provisioning. So setting aside some of their sales every month, every quarter to cover the risk of a loss. Um, they've moved on from that and taken that insurance instead. Um, so there are a number of other mitigants, but Insurance is really going to give you that that cast iron guarantee that if it all goes horribly wrong, you are going to get paid and most of your loss is going to get made up. So, and of course, the other way around is is that you want your suppliers to um, be able to supply you. Um, uh, so, if they need trade credit insurance, what can you do as a food and drink company to make sure that you're insurable? Yeah. So, this is this is a really interesting point, and we're doing a lot of work in this space right now. So, we're helping our customers get their credit rating back on an even keel with the insurers uh, and it's the same principles you know it's, it's the insurers will want up-to-date financials they want to know your liquidity position moving forward they want to know a bit more about your banking facilities uh, your outlook your strategy are you as you were saying earlier moving into new product lines or new services so you know is that going to be a factor in your uh, in the balance sheet moving forward um, and then fundamentally, it's just working out who to speak to at the insurance company to make sure you get a fair, you know, a fair hearing. Uh, and like any good accountant will tell you, uh, it's about how you communicate the messages behind the numbers too. Yeah. So, okay. So turning to Ireland, I mean, one of the key issues here then with trade credit insurance is this, if you haven't got it, um, the other alternatives are to make sure that you've got enough working capital in the system so that you can extend that, cra that credit facility. Um, what's the attitude at the moment with all these bounce back Sybils and the others? I mean, if somebody turns up on your doorstep at the moment, Alan, expecting more working capital, what's the response going to be? Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, without stating the obvious, with the, the amount of liquidity that's in the uh, system at the moment, it, albeit debt liquidity, we'd be very surprised if somebody came very early looking for cash flow finance at this moment in time. It's one of the hardest lens. It's one of the most difficult ones to, to uh, or highest risk. And, and the first question would be, well, why haven't you taken advantage of what's in the marketplace and got, got money from Sybil's, Pibble's, bounce back or what, whatever was available. And there was a lot available and still is some. Um, and I know a lot of companies have taken that money and it's sitting on deposit and that's not, that's not wrong. That's they, they are preparing to bounce back and keep their employees and, and, and get back into trade. If you haven't done that, then that's the first obvious question. Why didn't you do that? And if you like, there's a question mark over, over management if you haven't done that. If there's a plausible story why you didn't do that and why the cash flow need is now because bigger contracts come in different terms, then it's, uh, it's a little bit like uh, Sean was saying, you've got to prepare. So you've got to come in with your figures up to date, 
with the figures on the, the people you're supplying and the contracts you're taking so that we've got a credible, plausible story to believe how the money is going to be repaid and what term it's going to be repaid in. And also, I guess, if you come in showing everything's insured, so there is no chance of bad debts. Um, I mean, let's go, go down. Firstly, you've got to come in showing that the sales are definite. They're going to happen. They've got profit on them. And you've got your supplies to do them. Their terms are reasonable and you will be paid. But then if you're not going to be paid, then insurance wouldn't do any harm. We are expecting really cash flow funding to be more of a requirement. Not this winter, really, probably next year, next March, next April, next May, when all those direct debits start, in, start hitting of all the loans that are being taken. Um, that's going to be a challenge, let's be honest, because if the marketplace is, is really strong, then we, we call, probably can help. If the marketplace isn't strong, um, then cash isn't going to be highly available. Uh, we already see the high street now drawing back high street banks, um, for for liquidity because they're looking at what bad debts they're going to have on their balance sheets coming coming forward. So you've got to prepare. You've got to have a plausible story um, and and have it all, all your figures up to date and, and answer all the questions before you come in. If you're going under prepared, then you actually you can set hairs running and, and get the wrong answers. So the, the message there is is that um, coming to you too soon without doing the preparation may actually spoil your chances of getting the support if you actually need it yes that's right i mean you you can come back of course you can again and again and in a development bank we will always talk to you but if you come in sort of half cocked and you haven't got all the information then actually it puts a big question mark over um your ability as a management team or the way you've thought it through there will be some companies out there alan that don't know that they've got bad debt yet the businesses that were furloughed and there was a bit of trade credit sort of left not sorted out um what's your attitude or what's your uh, feeling about how much trouble is yet to come out of the woodwork for the guys that you're dealing with it's a, that's quite a difficult one um as you said some sectors have done some parts of food and drink have done really well it's been really good for them other parts it's gone into a, do, a kind of dormant state and it's going to come back out now, there will be a lot of debtors parked and agreed, and it's a two-way street because you'll have agreed with your creditors, you know, look, we'll have to pay these when we get back or we pay a bit on the pound and, and, and we get going. There is going to be some pain, isn't there? You can just can see that there's going to be pain. However, you know, it's a, all about communication there, uh, that you have communicated with your customers, your customers are communicating with you so that if you have a particularly big exposure to somebody that we feel has got problems you can come back and say yes but look i've got their up-to-date management accounts i've got their cash flows and actually i got they know their bank facilities are being supported so we believe you're going to be paid also i guess you've got to write in a reasonable amount of bad debt into your forward uh, forecasting because if you're going to put everything's going to be hunky-dory and 100 percent paid then we'll probably just par it back and then if it doesn't make sense, then you don't get the facility, I guess. So in a way, you're doing what Sean is doing, is, is that you're, you're assessing some of the risk in there as well. And yeah. um, it should really be, as we call it, management by no surprises. Yes, that's, that's a fair way to put it. I mean, a, a forecasting I, I, um, is difficult in this circumstance. That is one of the most difficult things. And when it's something we're challenged on when we see a set of forecasts, what's this based on? Yeah. We need you to substantiate your forecast by saying this is based on, you know, this customer have said they want this level of supplies, this one's this one, and, and, and also we've gone all the way up and got our figures, but then we've parred them back because we think it won't quite come to that. And, and, and anything you can do, do to put behind that as evidence of why those sales are coming and the timings of them just makes them more credible and makes you first in the queue to hopefully get the facility you're after. Brilliant. Thanks, Alan. Before I come to Phil, we've had some questions come in. Um, we've got, uh, well, two really. One's about really is this just a, for, a sophisticated form of brokering, but also what does the credit insurance cover? Is it all risk or selected specific risks? Sean, do you want to just pick up on those sort of that issue about what are you getting cover for? And, and that point about it being individual companies that you might find that you, uh, out of your portfolio of customers, um, that you that you can't get cover on all of them. Yeah. So the risk the risk that's covered, firstly the easier one, 
Um, the risks that are covered are essentially your invoices. Your invoices are, you know, there has to be an invoice uh, for the dispatches that you've made. Um, and it has to be within the terms of the policy. So the credit terms will be specified in the policy, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no performance risk. Uh, it's just the, the invoices that are covered under the policy. So if the goods go missing or if, you know, there's, there's something that happens in the supply chain further back in, the, in, the, uh, in that chain, there's no cover. It's just the invoices that are covered. Can you cover specific risks? Yes, you can. You know, you can look at your ledger and you can say, actually, maybe I just want to cover this particular customer or these five or these 10 or everything above 50,000 pounds. It can be done. Um, so if you get a big customer, yeah. a big new customer, and I remind everybody of the old adages I was taught many years ago by a, a rather hardened cheesemaker that uh, said there's no such thing as a new customer, there's just somebody else's bad debtor. But, I think it's <laughs> yes, but, but if you do get that new surprise wonder customer, you can go and get some insurance cover on that if, if, if you feel you need it. You can, you can. I mean, if you come to me and say, I've, I've, I've got a 10 million pound order now to supply Virgin Atlantic, um, you're not you're not going to get it. It's still down to the quality and the underlying quality of the of the credit risk, uh, and it will be more expensive because the insurer is naturally going to charge a little bit more just to focus on one risk. They do like to see a whole portfolio, but it can be done. It certainly right. can be done. If yeah. Not. Okay. I mean, not to do you out of a job, Sean, but turning to Phil, there's more than one way of managing these sort of risks, isn't there, Phil? And particularly from primary producers, and you you deal with a lot of those guys. Um, pooling risk, you know, I'm thinking of co-ops, farm groups and the like, um, they can access markets collectively that they couldn't perhaps handle the risk on individually. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's right, John. I think there's, um, uh, there's a few things that I'd sort of um, uh, point to for the businesses out there that are, are, are kind of struggling or scratching their heads. Um, on some of these, um, some of these bits, it, insurance can play a really um, important role. But actually, um, we've been talking about no surprises, um, and we talked about communication. Well, getting to know uh, your supply chain a bit better. One of the things that we've seen, uh, which has been really um, impressive, actually, in a way, um, as a result of the, uh, the the crisis that we've faced is that actually conversations that weren't happening that should have been happening um, in the supply chain have started to kind of take off. Um, and you've got, you almost had two categories of, of clients, those that were gonna go and bury their head in the sand and hope for the best. Um, and those that were on the phone to all of uh, their supply chain, uh, backwards and forwards, um, and saying, look, how are things? What have you got lined up? Have we got stuff coming in? Are you okay? Where is that at? Okay, we're going to get that shipment. Right, now it's gone out the door. How are you going to pay? Where are you at? Have you taken a Sybil's loan? Um, and so I don't disagree that um, trying to get hold of, you know, your Equifax, your Dun & Bradstreet, your, your, your reports to get information on your supply chain is important. But actually, let's not forget that we've got ready access um, uh, to the supply chain because we're working with with them all day every day. I had you um, the point that Alan raised about um, some of that credit history being historical and we were in a very fast moving situation what would you advise people to do to be aware of the the current risk? Yeah I think that's um, uh, really interesting and um, as an accountant it won't surprise you to learn that I want people uh, to have up-to-date financial information that they can <laughs> use to run their business every day um, and not everybody has that, um, which uh, is a source of enormous frustration, as you might imagine. Yes. Um, uh, and the truth is, you, you know, you, you probably probably have worked out now that you need to have that. Um, I think you've then got to try and have that conversation, as I said, and, and some of you, you, you've got to take it with a pinch of salt, OK, because you're perhaps talking directly to whoever it is um, and seeking to understand how they're going as a business. But I think there is a greater degree of collaboration than we've seen in the past, a greater willingness to share um, information about what's um, what's going on and asking some of those challenging questions is is absolutely what's been expected. Um, uh, uh, and you would expect that, that the businesses you were working with have answers because actually I, 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 I'm, I'm very firm in the belief that the food 
uh, industry has got to emerge out of this as a collective um, and you know gearing up as a collective restocking as a collective uh, it's going to be something that we're going to have to kind of tread carefully with uh, i'd also encourage people to be thinking about managing their um uh, their their credit exposure um you know i've got clients that would look at um, a discount for payment upon delivery so they're cutting that need out immediately um, yeah. and they're shortening their working capital cycle immediately um, you've got um, uh, notoriously um, businesses uh, that I work with are poor at imposing credit limits on uh, on uh, the people that they work with so rather than relying on the insurance to catch it actually have you assessed what you're comfortable in giving but phil uh, most, most most food and drink producers and the speakers formerly one myself it was a bit of a vulgar subject mentioning the money you know i mean it's all about the the, the food and, and its loveliness and and it's rather you know it's rather vulgar to, to talk about the price and how soon do you think you might pay and hence why um <clears throat> i'm not going to admit to how many thousands but I was certainly down on the game because we thought we were had a lovely customer and they turned out to be less than lovely now um, yes you know the, the point was made about you can make a, a provision for bad debt but that's a provision that's still coming out of your pocket um, what you know would should I have gone open book or something as a way of ensuring that there was a, a closer relationship and that price and terms were discussed earlier yeah that's a that's a real um challenge john and as you know there are not a lot of contracts out there for a lot of um uh, the business that's written in food and drink that um uh, you know because people don't get down to the kind of formality because it is all about the story of your lovely um your lovely uh, product um, I, I, I don't have an easy answer to that um i, I think that there is a opportunity with what has happened for a greater transparency and actually some just open conversations about what we're doing um, in business with one another um, and so I do think there's been a shift in what people are willing to um, uh, to kind of talk about um, and to uh, uh, and to open up about and actually for some people it's probably about taking that leap from saying I am um, uh, you know I'm the, uh, the owner of this brilliant food brand that has got this provenance to I am in business. Yeah, give us your money. And, and I've got to make this work for me. But yeah. by the way, I've got this fantastic food brand that's got this provenance behind it. And, and, and I want to kind of promote that. So I think that, you know, let's not let's not be naive. Uh, you can't sell your fantastic food brand um, if you've got no cash. Um, uh, 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 and some of those tough conversations, I think, have, um, uh, have got to happen. But we've seen, particularly with retailers and with online, people paying much quicker. I mean, uh, the great thing about online is it's money up front. Is, I don't know if that's insurable, Sean, when you, when you do sell online, particularly with some of the new, um, uh, I won't name names, but some of the more interesting online retailers who act as aggregators of demand and you're your money is not usually up for more than seven or 14 days but your money is out mm. yeah i mean that's yeah that's 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 insurable that's 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 covered obviously cash sales aren't there's no need but yeah online sales aggregators online merchants of course yeah because you can because some people have been borrowing against that as well i don't know alan what what the, the attitude of the bank is but i presume that you want to see more different channels in future to market to market rather than people wandering up with a, a, a big retailer and that being the bulk of their business it's probably always been the case spreading your risk which is easier said than done because obviously most businesses have some key contracts and we kind of understand that but yes if you can spread your risk if you can spread your repayment your um, payment terms if for new clients you can get look yes we're willing to supply you but it's going to have to be performer initially for so long to try to get some knowledge of them understand how they work and if you know when they pay in pro forma, actually pro forma already turns out to be 10 days and then it gets to 20, then actually you do have to think, well, 
how much am I going to commit to these people? How much of, uh, of a bad debt am I willing to take? Or am I willing to go and borrow against this? So it's my debt then, you know, it's my debt in my name and poss possibly some personal liability. So it's kind of those, those eye-open understanding what you're getting into. But yeah, if you can spread your risk, it's great. But it, it is difficult. We, we kind of understand that a lot of businesses have some big key contracts and they've had them for years. Um, but then you do need to get very close to those customers to understand them, um, to really listen to everything that's going on. Um, at the moment, as I said earlier, they should be liquid. There shouldn't be any reason for them not to be paying you. I think it's further down the line that the liquidity may become a problem. But if they're negotiating really hard for longer terms at the moment, you've got to either cover yourself through insurance or something or you've got to ask a question, why, why are they doing that at this point? Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's really hard to turn business out because that's turning your own turnover off, if you like. Um, but it's better than getting the bad debt that could be very critical to your business. Sean, the, I was talking to a, 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 a landlord um, of a pub I know, <clears throat> strangely, uh, this week, who has just started back and he's got 30% of the volume that he would otherwise have had. And he doesn't get trade credit terms at the moment. Now, if he'd had trade credit terms previously, um, you'd have expect that insurance to go back in place, but it's not going back in place at the moment. There's talk of a government scheme to try and do something about that at the moment. Well, this is the big good news story. This is the White Knight. Um, about a month ago, the government announced that they were going to provide <clears throat> what we call some reinsurance support to the mainline insurers to the value of about 10 billion. It's 10 billion. Of, of support. So it's a behind the scenes arrangement between the insurers and the government. No extra cost uh, to the policy holder, to the insured. Um, and the way it works essentially is that uh, the government has said to the insurers, you must come back on cover uh, where you've previously withdrawn cover due to COVID-19 related issues. So certainly in, in the food and drink sector, hospitality would be uh, an industry or a subsector that would certainly benefit, for example, from the government scheme. What's the catch? Well, the catch is that um, you have to reapply. You have to reapply for the credit limit that you require. So it's not automatically reinstated. You have to go back to the insurer and say, I now need cover and here are my confirmed orders uh, moving forward. Uh, but it's great news. Um, it was announced a month ago. Uh, it was sent to the European Commission for rubber stamping. Rubber stamping. Uh, mm -hmm. and a month later, we're still we're still waiting. But I was told yesterday that uh, um, finalisation will be uh, in a couple of days. So you heard it here first. Um, so what will that mean? That'll mean that where you did have trade credit cover, you should be able to get it reinstated. Get it reinstated, yeah. It doesn't make a bad risk a good risk. So what the government is saying to the insurers, if you were going to pull cover anyway, because of the financials, because you'd had overdues reported on that particular customer and the outlook was, you know, was serious and severe, that you cannot come back on cover. It has to be COVID-19 uh, related. Um, okay, that so that, there's an element of interpretation there because as, as we know, is. hospitality uh, sector has been difficult in any case. Yeah, but, but there, there's clearly been, you know, a number of what I would call mass exercises where, you know, great swathes of cover has been removed on a subsector um, and that's unacceptable to government. And that's going to be um, one of the focus points. I think that's where it's got bogged down with the European Commission is the interpretation. What do you mean by COVID-19 related? Um, but importantly, you have to have a credit insurance policy to, to qualify. So if you're already a user, you can access the scheme. Just, just on that point then, where companies uh, um, have had a policy, their board has said, we will only sell or supply people who we can get trade cover on and that trade cover is effectively removed because you can't get insurance what did you know what what will this make any difference to that and what are their alternatives is there a higher premium for more risk uh i think at the moment uh, it's back to the bookmaker point you know i think all bets are off and there are just some risks that are just too great for any insurer to to bet uh, to, to bear 
Um, but this, this scheme should enable the insurers to come back on risk. And it's backdated until the 1st of April, by the way. So if you had a limit pulled after the 1st of April, it could potentially be reinstated. And it runs until the end of the year. And there's a review point in September. And the government will then decide whether to, to roll it forward for another few months, depending on where we are um, with the economic environment. Um, so it's not a magic wand because there are, there are conditions attaching. But covers available. There's no extra cost. It has to be good news. Okay, and before I come to Phil about the um, the, the pricing of, uh, of of credit into into individual customers or, or products, the the fact that the hospitality is coming back, Sean, this all now, and obviously this autumn and the run up to Christmas, um, if they come back and they're not the same company that they were before, if they've if a, you know a couple of pubs have been bought up by another and, and they're in a different company, so it's a newer company, how how are you going to get trade cover on those guys? Well, that, that feels to me like a new application. So that's about presenting, you know, as Alan was saying, presenting the, the numbers, the detail to the insurer uh, with a view to getting cover. So if there, have, if there have been changes to the business, if they restructured, if they've got new owners, private equity, it's a reset. And I think you would go again and say- Can And you... the new co is more likely to be difficult to get cover on than an established business. Yeah, I mean, what you need to watch out for, um, and maybe Phil has a view on this, is, is pre-packed situations, you know, where organizations have gone bust uh, under a pre-packed arrangement, dumped their suppliers and started again and hoping everything is going yeah. to be okay with the mm -hmm. world. We've had some famous ones of those in the food and drink sector. <laughs> yeah, I'm aware of I that. Mean, I experienced one myself a few years ago with Wittard of Chelsea, literally overnight pre-packed yeah. and back up and running, but they hadn't paid the previous suppliers their bills and they were flogging their stuff. So um, that's, you know, are we going to see, well, that's a question for Phil, really. Are we going to see more of that or less of that, Phil? Uh, more insolvency. Yeah, and pre-packs and people coming, springing back as the, the new improved version. Yes, simply. Um, <laughs> could, could, could you just let us know which ones in the food and drink sector, so that we know? Which one? <laughs> uh, it, it, yeah, and look, there was it, it was already a, um, uh, a, a, a it's already been um, an industry with pretty fine margins, um, is what I would say. And it, you know, if you go and erode a, a whole marketplace, you shut something down for for three, six, nine months, um, then there is only one uh, possible outcome. And the government with the support, which, um, you know, by the way, I think in terms of speed of delivery um, has been impressive thus far, um, has uh, taken the bet that they will support enough businesses um, that they will be able to um, soften the scarring in the Bank of England's words. Um, and, uh, and, um, allow enough business to continue such that um such that they can mop up some of the kind of casualties um truthfully and and, and that's the, the the pretty tough um reality um you, you did mention a point on pricing and um uh pricing your bad debt into yeah, um please. into what was um going on john i was sort of um, thinking about it and and the truth is you need um, as any business to understand the price that you are going to um, sell at and what that is going to deliver um it, it i've been thinking about this quite a lot recently and um uh, it's bloody difficult um and forgive the language but um i'm an accountant sat here scratching my head because i look at spreadsheets all of the time um and and trying to work through with businesses but when you factor in what might my bad debt look like and um, what do i understand about the new furlough scheme um, and how that's being phased out and therefore what my employees uh, might cost me um, and therefore what is my cost of production um, what um what if anything is a vat change going to do for me um, in terms of um, possible demand down the chain or am I in hospitality myself and do I understand what's going to happen in terms of the kind of um, VAT position? Um, do I understand my cash flow position when I pick up my VAT bill next year that's been deferred? Um, have I remembered that I've got VAT coming back into charge this quarter? Um, 
am I subsidizing my whole business model with a grant that I've been given or a bounce back loan that I've been given? And that's a really good point, though, because aren't surely a lot of characteristics of a food and drink business is, is that cyclical, that we often have a, a, a lead up to Christmas, hence why we have so many insolvencies in February, because they crystallize out then. The only problem is, is that as Alan was asking us to do earlier, so you've got to try and forecast um, for what the cycle is going to be and whether it's the same cycle as we had last year and therefore how much working capital are we going to need because we don't know how many customers we're going to have or when they're going to rock up. Yeah, and the best advice that I've got is that you've got to um, understand two things. You've got to understand um, your profit and loss and your cash flow. You can't do one. You can't do, um, uh, uh, you, you've got to do both. Um, you, you've got to have a best crack and you've got to relook at it every week, every month. Um, to understand what you what you think it is starting to look like, um, and that is a um, uh, a tiresome exercise. And um, there are some tools out there that will help you, but you've got to do that. Tiresome me. exercise, Phil. This doesn't sound like an accountant. Not for me. I mean, I relish the opportunity to. I was um, going to say, well, I, I buried my head in a spreadsheet. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously, um, I've been known to be a bit of a spreadsheet monkey myself. But I mean, it does come back to this business about forecasting. And before you even go near a bank or an insurer at the moment, it sounds very much as if forecasting and being able to articulate what your business needs are and how you're managing them and how you're pricing in either the upcoming costs of unfurloughing staff or the cost of uh, potential bad debt and or how you're going to manage that, that risk, which is handy because next Tuesday at eight o'clock in the morning, we're having another one of these, these sessions where we're going to be talking about forecasting and, and managing and mitigating for, for financial risk. Why would you want to miss that? Uh, but anyway, that's the plug plug for next week i think actually i mean we should really ask everybody um in fact I, 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 andy richardson has asked me to ask you all um if you had access to um, the government today what would be on your wish list for things that they could do to actually make a big difference to the food and drink sector and trade credit availability today sean would you like to kick off with that one well we haven't mentioned the b word and uh and Brexit, I guess, needs to be resolved. It seems to be, you know, taking secondary. Um, I don't think we've got time for that one today. No, but I think I think making a resolution on on Brexit for the food and drink sector and making sure that you know the certainty or the uncertainty that it's yeah, providing a decision and a, you know a, a resolution, I suppose. So, from an insurer's point of view, is that uncertainty about Brexit and whether or not you you're trading? Uh, outside of the sterling zone, yeah. is that going to make a difference to your insurability? Yeah, it, it, it does. It does. I mean, remember the market was distressed even before COVID. There were some well, there were some serious risks on the horizon, and insolvencies were rising. So, it's not all about just COVID. Uh, it is about other issues like Brexit too. Yeah, yeah, and we've got winter coming and Christmas and chilled storage space at a premium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Alan, what would you, you're, you've, you've, you've got access to the government, what would you ask them to do for us all at the moment, please? Be it Welsh government or UK government? Well, firstly, I echo um, what I think Phil said, that they have reacted quickly. They have helped. Um, it's been phenomenal, actually, the amount of liquidity they've put in. I think possibly now they need to start listening to specific like, food uh, areas and specific people like yourselves, possibly, to say what is the specific areas of support, of support that's needed because it's been blanket up until now. Everybody can have X, everybody can furlough. There's some businesses that cannot operate <clears throat> with the two meter or the meter distancing. It just doesn't make any sense. They've got to stay closed. And it's now become more specific to different areas of how we can support those. Blanket, I think, is finished because uh, the trouble with that is there's people actually uh, taking support that don't need it. And I think it needs now to be more specific to certain areas that actually, because of the criteria or where we are at the moment, can't trade. Or if they can trade, they just lose more money. So it's about looking at specific areas and getting some expertise in to say, look, this is where you need to channel your money now. So it becomes uh, sort of more detailed, more granular, down, down to uh, you know, certain areas rather than blanket now. And with, with, with that, and 
the, the sort of mopping up of those problems, it does beg the question of if we're going to see more mergers and acquisitions. Are you in the, do you think there'll be funding for that sort of thing where two wrongs particularly could make a right if they can get economies of scope and scale in place? Well, I don't know if funding is, is what will be needed because what I think if that's going to happen in some of the larger businesses have now war chests, even if those war chests are um, debt war chests, but very reasonably cheap debt, um, they can use those um, uh, to come together. Um, they would make sense to a certain extent. Um, if you can understand the philosophy, uh, why it's going to make sense, then yeah, we, we would look at those opportunities because yeah, they could, there could be some good opportunities out there, but it would be good actually, uh, sorry to say the same thing, if they come together, obviously it's got to be well planned, but also that they're putting their own money on the table as well as trying to get debt into it. Right. And a more targeted response from the government for those cases um, that, that start to emerge as finding it difficult to trade yes. on in the current circumstances. Yeah, yes, indeed. Hugh, you've been sat listening and taking notes, I noticed. Did, what's, what's your thoughts and what would you have us all do as a result of today and what you've heard? Yeah, I, I suppose my message to the government is that you know, actually, we're speaking personally from a public perspective. You know, a lot of the companies that supply the large retailers are still, have done well through this crisis. You know, so I think it's, you know, we've got to do whatever we can to help the businesses that are struggling. You know, but there are some businesses that were perhaps weak before this, so it's going to be terminal. Plus, that does then create gaps in the market, opportunities for other businesses. So, one of the things I would say to the government is to make sure you keep supporting the sector. To grow and develop as well, you know, the, the support services that were in place before the crisis, you know, make sure that, you know, the, the same energy in those, in those services as well. But you've spoken in the past about the need for financial literacy and for businesses to take yeah. more interest in their finance. And I think the message from Sean, Phil and Alan has all, have all been, if you want to come and make a case to us, you've got to be coherent. What, what can be done about that, Hugh? Well, you know, that's what the public business is built on. We've got a, what we call a predictive model that runs a kind of year ahead and we do weekly profit and losses. Everything is absolutely reconciled with a penny. We can probably predict our profit for the next 12 months within within 5%, you know, and our cash flow, you know, from that as well. You know, we're lucky that we, you know, sell kind of relatively reliable blocks of potatoes to the big retailers so we can forecast pretty easily. But that gives us absolute you know, going kind to of finite financial control, and that allows us to drive efficiency, you know, control our capex, all the things that we need to do. And it's, you know, I kind of, and, you know, for those businesses who are kind of starting off, I can't underemphasize how important that is in this business. You know, it's almost been a kind of lesson to me the last kind of eight or nine years that we've got better in that and how much control that gives you, you know, and what confidence it gives the banks if you want to borrow for a new project and these type of things. You know, when you're delivering financial numbers to a bank every month and they're exactly what you said they were going to be, you know, that uh, that gives confidence and, you know, allows you to grow and builds good partnerships. Do you think the government or agencies give us enough information about the marketplace at the moment? And, uh, you know, this, this coming back to Sean's point about being able to go and check on companies and ensure that you know what the risks are that you're taking. Do you think, is there anything that can be done in that area at all? I think that's a different one, isn't it? Because everybody knows their own sectors. You know, there's, as soon as the government tries to get into understanding individual sectors, it can be, you know, it's very difficult for them to do that, isn't it? Whereas yeah. companies working in sector know the players, they know the kind of environment that those guys are working within. So, you know, there is a responsibility for businesses as well to understand where they are. I think that's coming through from, from, the, from the three of the panelists today is, is understanding your supply chain, if you know what I mean, and talking and communication, I think, uh, is one of the keys the keys to it. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Hugh. So, guys, um, any final points you want to make in terms of um, the top tip that we would send ev everybody away with? Sean, top tip? Well, it has to be, if you're not currently a user of credit insurance, take a fresh look. Yeah, yeah. Phil? Top tip. Take your last year's accounts, make sure you actually understood those and try and work out from there all those pages at the back that you never read, which have got a load of information in. What does that look like next month, 
yeah. the month after and for the next year. Yeah, yeah, that for, that that ability to understand your business and the direction of travel. Yeah, because and entrepreneurs don't want to do it. They they want to run the business because that's the exciting bit, and we get that. But dar darling, we're artists. You know, it's so vulgar talking. <laughs> <about them. laughs> uh, Alan, Alan. <laughs> Um, Top tip B for us, please. I guess it's to say is be prepared, but also be honest and don't be worried about coming to have a conversation with your bank manager, with a bank advisor, with your accountant. Be honest and understand where your marketplace lies, where where you think it's going. And if you need to borrow, make a good case for that. But but do think of it from the other side. Think, right, what's going to make that guy or that girl the other side going to think, yeah, this is one to support. This is one I want to get behind. So try to think of it from both sides um, and not sort of just, oh, yeah, I've got this opportunity. Everything's going to be wonderful. You've got to put it in the context of where the marketplace is at this moment in place, moment in time. Yeah. And, we are, and we are still lending, by the way. I know I come over a bit that way, but we are still lending. <laughs> uh, no, that's brilliant. That's great. <laughs> well, gen gentlemen, I think um, all of you, I have to say thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. It's been, uh, you know, personally... Uh, I think it's been great. You know, we've got some real insights. Appreciate the questions that we've had from, from the other side of the, the, the panel. Um, just remind everybody that next Tuesday at eight o'clock, we're doing our managing, uh, forecasting and managing or mitigating financial risk seminar. So hopefully um, we can get lots of people signed up for that one and lots of great questions. Um, thank you, Hugh, for the Food Board for instigating this. I hope everybody has a, a lovely day once again. Thank you all very much indeed for your time and attention. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.